in part two, we are going to be talking about the big shocker at the end of this episode. We're going to be talking about fat and rendering fat and food safety. We're going to be talking about the mental aspects and how the ways we talk about our time out, the ways we talk about ourselves and the relationship we have to the land can have a really big impact on our time. So many people bringing in so much food. It's been amazing. So I love that Carrie takes her time to make her offerings and then boom, lands that beautiful trout. And what a lovely trout, right? It looks like it's perhaps her first one. And it happened when she went in with intention and made her offerings to the land. And I love that. I love how much we're seeing people on this season talk about those deeper parts of survival. And Carrie talks about it that, yeah, you can bring in enough calories here, but what really makes your stay is coming from the right place and your spirit and your sense of place and how deeply you connect with this place. And that is exactly what I've been trying to get through every time I've talked about alone since my experience on season six. It is the mental, emotional, spiritual that is way more important than the physical skills, right? I probably had less to eat than most people on season six, but I was the runner up because I loved that place. And just like Adam talks about, I considered every day a gift. And that was the real win for me. Not whether or not I was the last one there, but could every single day feel like a win? And could I find something beautiful to appreciate in every single day? And I did, and it kept me there for two and a half months in the Arctic winter, right? Well, only part of that was Arctic winter, but you get what I'm saying. It is all about spirit, mental, emotional toughness, and the physical skills, they're really important too. Don't get me wrong, but it is the balance of them. And we consistently see people who think they've got the physical skills who don't make it long-term because they don't have those other pieces. Loved seeing Carrie pull in that beautiful trout. I've known Carrie for a long time, so I happen to know that she was a commercial fisherwoman in Alaska running her own boat for many years. So this lady knows fish. <laughs> So I loved getting to see her pull that beautiful trout out of the water. Awesome, Carrie. Love seeing you feasting on that delicious, rich, fatty trout. We go back to Juan Pablo and we see him using that awesome dock. Really reminded me of Zach Fowler on season three, who made a dock in Patagonia and used it to fish from. So we started out seeing him building it and now we get to see him using it. And dang! clearly worth the effort, right? So he has made it out into the deeper water, better casting, and he is doing so good with the fish. And he says something that I think is really important to talk about. He says, as he's building the dock, this is also going to get me out to where the water is cleaner. And this is really important because Juan Pablo is choosing not to boil his water, right? He's just drinking it right from the river. And it is absolutely true what he says. There are less parasites in the water out in the middle of the stream or a lake if you're on a lake and under the surface. So if you are somewhere where you have to drink untreated water, do your best to get out at least 15 feet from the shore and two feet underwater. So take your pot and plunk it down. The parasites are going to congregate in the area that has more access to light and more access to nutrients. So on the sides where it's shallow, warmer water close to the soil is going to be the highest in the parasites. And that's where most people are going to be drawing their water from. So for Juan Pablo to go out to the middle of the river and dunk his pot down to the deeper water and then bring it back up with that further and deeper water, awesome strategy. Really important thing to know about drinking wild water. Thanks for demonstrating it and mentioning it, Juan Pablo. So I want to point out the difference in the way Juan Pablo is talking about the fact that he's not going to tap and the way that Benji talks about not going to tap. So what I hear in Juan Pablo isn't I'm the toughest and I can do this and I'm better than anyone and I'm going to stay this amount of time because I'm going to beat the record. I hear I'm treating this like a survival situation where there is no tap out button. So tapping out isn't even a choice, right? So he is saying it as a mindset around, this is my life now and I'm gonna stay here. Whereas I hear Benji talking about it more from a competitive place and a place that sounds more based on ego and less on humility. And I like the fact that I get to talk about this because 
Benji is going to point that out and talk about it too. So even though I don't agree with some of the ways that Benji is talking about this stuff, I really love the way he comes back around. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the mental emotional game at the end of this review, but really, really interesting to note the difference between how these two guys are talking about it. Saying the same thing, I'm never going to tap, but how they do it, hugely different. I just love so much of what Benji has to share. I love him talking about sharpening his axe and how it's a great way to start a day and so much better than watching the news and getting all worked up about it. And the fact that it's better to play with an axe than to sit around and play with your phone. Awesome. Love that they showed that. That said, then he said something else that I didn't agree with, which is even with the best modern tools, fleshing a hide is a lot of work. And I'm a hide tanner by trade, and I don't find that to be true. I find fleshing by far the physically easiest part of the hide tanning process. So this shows me that Benji likely doesn't have a whole lot of experience with hide tanning. It also brings me back to something I said in the last episode when we watched him skinning it, and he was taking it mostly off with his knife. And I said, you know, he's potentially damaging the hide, and he is definitely leaving a lot of fat and meat on that hide. So if you're really conscientious in the way you skin, fleshing doesn't have to be very much work. Also, he's using a really skinny beam and not the best tools. Of course, he doesn't have a lot of tools. Really glad that he wasn't actually fleshing it with his axe. He, I was worried that that's what he was sharpening the axe for, and that would have been a terrible way to go about it. But that beam that he made, it's really quite small. It's not ideal. That might be another reason why he finds fleshing a little challenging. I'm going to point you out to a video of mine making a scraping beam for hide tanning that takes you through the whole process and a shape of scraping beam that I think is a lot more effective than that little narrow one he's using there. Also love Benji talking about fat and how it's been vilified, especially like 80s and 90s. And now that's less true right now. We hear a lot of paleo and keto and fat is good just have it be good fat and throw out your margarine for god's sake eat butter so yes healthier frosting that lovely rendered beaver fat i love getting to see that beautiful burn bowl full of beaver fat that stuff is like gold so we hear benji talking about it here we've heard about it on other seasons and i'm guessing that a lot of people don't actually know what he means when he says i need to render this fat to preserve it so fat is a tissue in our bodies made of cells that swell up with fat. The cells are something that is going to break down over time. It's tissue like anything else and it can rot. Whereas pure fat doesn't rot. There's nothing in it but fat. There's no cells and you know proteiny bits that are gonna break down. So the rendering process involves cutting up the fatty tissue and then cooking it down until the cells burst and the liquid fat comes out of the cells. And then the leftover parts are what we would call the cracklings. It's basically the fatty tissue with most of the fat out of it. Bacon is a great example. After you've cooked it down and all that lovely bacon fat comes out and then you've got it crispy. So just picture that without the red stripes that are the muscle meat. And that is essentially cracklings and you've rendered fat in the process of cooking bacon. Benji also talks about something I've talked about before. I love how many of the things that I mentioned that Benji circles around to and mentions on the show, but that is how difficult it is to shoot up into trees. When you're shooting up, it's a lot more difficult to know the exact angle. And again, when you're shooting up so many little branches, so easy if you miss for your arrow to go out a different angle than you thought it would be, and it's so hard to find them again. So I really feel for Benji taking that shot as he took it. I was like, ooh, that, if he doesn't hit it, that arrow is gone. Look at how dense the trees are behind him. So hard to find an arrow with the deep sphagnum moss. Oh my goodness. Also want to talk about the arrow tip that we can see that Benji got that grouse with. So this is what we would call a blunt. And there's a thing that you can screw on if you're using screw in arrowheads that is that little round with all of those razor sharp things coming out. So those are great for shooting at small game because it's blunt rather than sharp. So it's going to perhaps puncture, perhaps just hit and stun the bird or the squirrel or what have you. But in this case, it was perfect because it went through, but it didn't slice through so fast to go all the way 
through it. And then that little screw in piece that he put in there, that does two things. One, obviously it's gonna do more damage to make it more likely to kill the bird outright rather than just wound it. But it's also going to mean that that arrow is less likely to bury itself in the soil or in the sphagnum moss. So all of those little pieces are gonna act as stoppers. So the arrow should only go in as far as those. And then it'll be much more easy to find because it's not buried so deep and much more easy to pull out. So really, really great arrowheads to be bringing for the kind of small game hunting that he's doing. And then of course he also has broadheads for the big game. So really nice setup. Benji then talks about the organs of the grouse and he says, oh, most of the organs were good. But what he's holding in his hand is the gizzard and the heart, which are only the organs that are up in the upper part of the chest cavity, not down below. And that shot looks like it may have been through the liver, which causes a lot of bleeding. It tends to be a fatal shot, but not right away necessarily, but it looks like it came at an angle. Um, but just when he says the organs are okay, those aren't what I would think of as the major organs. When I'm thinking organs, I'm thinking liver and kidney as really, really important sources of nutrition, but also have a lot of fat. Whereas the gizzard, which is up top, the gizzard is basically like the mouth of birds in some ways, right? Because they have beaks, not teeth. And so they have an organ in their body that we don't have. It's this other pouch off of their throat that's a huge, strong muscle and they swallow rocks. And then that muscle mashes the food up with those rocks. So the rocks are essentially like their teeth. When we see Benji eating that grouse, we see it cooked in beaver fat, which looks amazing. Now that beaver fat, it's well rendered and it takes a lot of heat to do that. So I don't think there's any contamination in that fat. We're gonna talk about the potential contamination that Benji's dealing with as we get to the end. And then of course we circle back to Adam who is also feeling really unwell. Besides the fact that he's feeling unwell and laying in bed in the middle of the day, which certainly looks rough, it's a great shot because I love showing him with that beautiful bag that he's made out of his tarp that he's eating cranberries out of. Also, you can see strips of his tarp on his head behind him where he used the tarp as cordage to tie up his shelter. I talked to Adam about this and he said that he braided strips of his tarp to use it for all kinds of other things. So again, awesome, awesome example of Adam's ingenuity and making really good use of all of his things because he brought a tarp that is clearly reinforced with those strong fibers, it's much stronger than the average plastic tarp. So he can do a lot more with it. So while at first I was like, oh man, bringing a whole gear item just so you have clear windows and you know a little bit better shelter, I don't know about that gamble. But now that I'm seeing all of the awesome ways he's using it, now I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally get it. Great strategy, Adam, with that tarp that can provide so many of the things that you need out there. I love seeing Adam so choked up with gratitude in this scene because he's talking about how he just appreciates his life so much. And this is a great illustration of how the alone experience can really change our emotions. And most folks aren't prepared for how intensely you feel all of the emotions, the joy and the gratitude and the sorrow and the suffering when you're out in those environments. And there is something about fasting going dramatically undernourished that really draws this out. And that is part of why fasting is a spiritual practice for so many different peoples around the world. It's part of so many different religions, right? There's Lent with Catholicism. There's a lot of fasting in Islam. There's all kinds of world traditions that involve fasting, initiatory experiences often, rites of passage very often involve fasting. So I think that that is a really good example of the ways that we drop into this deeper place and we have a new perspective. And we can see that with Adam talking about home and how much he appreciates his life. There's nothing to make you appreciate the life you have than being really uncomfortable and underfed in a really harsh environment, right? We also see Adam's picture of his sweetheart right behind him. And as I've mentioned, having that up in your face while you're having a hard time, both reminds you of how you'd rather be there, but also reminds you of all of the wonderful things in your life back home and how much you have to go home to. And that can be wonderful and that can be hard. We saw that be part of what took Jacques out. So I'm really curious how it's going for Adam as we hear him really having a different emotional experience about his life back home 
while also having that photo right up in his face. We come back to Benji. It is with him having a hard time in the belly and wondering what is going on. And he mentions wondering if the, some of the meat from the hide was what did him in. I have to say, again, as a hide tanner, I have eaten a lot of things off hides. Not the average hides that I do, but certainly when I was on alone, I was eating everything that came off that hide. There's nothing inherently less good about the meat off of a hide than the meat anywhere else. So it is not about having eaten that funky stuff off the hide that is making Benji ill right now. I love that he mentions yarrow, a wonderful medicinal plant. It's very bitter and bitter things tend to be really good for the digestion and stomach. And we see Adam doing the same thing, looking for something bitter, making a tea of bitter birch inner bark. So love that both of these guys are talking about self-reliance and self-care and how to tend to themselves when they're not feeling well. It's an awesome example. Hey everyone, I want to remind you to please like the video, subscribe to my channel, and go ahead and hit the notifications bell if you wanna hear when my videos come out. Also really encourage you to consider joining my Patreon membership and you will get to talk to some of the participants of Alone Season 9 through that. I also wanna say that I have rendered a lot of fat in my life and I've eaten a lot of cracklings and I have definitely made myself throw up from eating too much cracklings. Really rich food is hard for the body to process, especially if it's not what you're normally used to. It looks like what Benji has going on is much more intense than that. And particularly if you watched the, um, what is it? The Ride Home, the little after special bonus thing that you can find on Amazon or the History app or other places online. It, we see the doctor treating him. So it's clearly more than just some brief stomach upset, but you can definitely make yourself throw up from eating cracklings. I have done it. It's not pretty. It's not as ugly as that was looking, but it's not pretty. So restraint people, it's really delicious, but you can imagine if you ate three packs of bacon, it would not go well. This was really cool. I did not know that birch bark was a medicinal. I looked it up and I read a bit about birch bark after seeing Adam collecting it and treating himself with that birch bark. I didn't find anything about it treating parasites or stomach complaints, but it is bitter. And he talks about that bitter medicine. And as I said, generally bitter things tend to be really good for the stomach and for the digestion. And some of our classical natural treatments for parasites and worms and such are strongly bitter things. Wormwood, for example, it's an artemisia. It's related to desert sagebrush and mugwort and tarragon, all the same genus. But that is the classic worm and parasite treating. It is profoundly bitter. So really, really awesome to see Adam trying the medicine that he had and it making a difference for him. Awesome. Way to go, Adam. And so glad to see that helping you. Also loved hearing Adam specifically say, looks like it's a self-care day. When I was on season six, I had a designated weekly self-care day where I tried to do a little something extra for myself. Sometimes it was a, a sponge bath like he's doing there, or sometimes just letting myself sit by the fire a little longer or letting myself take off my boots and dry my liners two times during the day instead of just one time during the day. Just something both to show my body that I'm paying attention and I love it and I care for it, get a little relaxation and ease, and then also something to make a routine and give myself little rewards for these small achievable goals. So every week, a little something to look forward to, self-care day. So love that Adam brought that up and is doing that this day. <sighs> and then of course, we come back to Benji and Benji is not doing well. His guts are really problematic. Now he's becoming feverish, the whole hot, cold, hot, cold, fever and chills, really hurting. Looks like it's coming out of both ends, not good. Looks like it's more intense than just crackling belly or even bad meat, which would be food poisoning, but usually isn't gonna come with a fever like that. So I wanna talk about what it potentially could have come from. And he's mentioned several times, I don't know, that meat didn't cook it well enough. So most parasites, except for prions, which are the kind of parasites that cause chronic wasting disease and mad cow disease, most parasites will be killed by cooking your meat really well. So that fat, definitely not parasites in there. You have to get fat so hot to melt it and to render it that that fat is not gonna be a problem. If he has cooked all of that meat really well, it shouldn't be a problem. But as he says, you're not washing your hands out there. So I'm guessing that the most likely thing is for him to have touched raw meat, not washed his hands, 
cooked meat well and then touched it with those same hands that were touching the raw meat. Now, beavers do carry giardia, as it says, that's why it's called beaver fever. So generally that's associated with a poop and not with the meat. But again, if you're cleaning animals, and especially if you actually let the intestines rupture in the cleaning of them, then it's possible that you've touched some of that and it's gotten on the meat. Good cooking should do it, but who knows what the cross contaminations might have been for him. So really, really hard to watch Benji go through all of that. But here's the thing. Here is where I wanna talk about the difference between Benji's attitude and Juan Pablo's attitude. I believe that nature loves humility. Making really big claims like, I can be out here more than 100 days, I'm gonna break the record, and I have more skills than any of the rest of the people, I'm gonna be the one to do this. I feel like Benji was really ripe to be taken down really hard. When you talk really big, you are setting yourself up for a bigger fall. Juan Pablo is saying, yeah, I just treat this like a survival situation. There is no tap out, so I'm not gonna tap out. But he's not saying, because I'm the best one out here and because I'm gonna break the record and because I deserve more to win than anybody else. And he is drinking untreated water and doesn't seem to be having any gut issues. Benji, we assume, is treating his water or he would have been mentioning the water as opposed to contamination from the meat when he's feeling sick. And boom, he is hurt. Was anybody else incredibly shocked see Benji taken out like that. From the way he was talking, I really felt like he had enough determination to stay through some level of discomfort. So it actually really makes me wonder if he was going through that for a lot longer than it looks like from the editing. And it does seem that way when you watch the, what is it, the ride back, the, the longer special bonus, that it was probably longer than just that night that we saw. It would have to be pretty intense for him to feel like he couldn't recover from it. And I want to say that Nathan on season six, he ate raw fish eggs out of, out of a fish he had just caught and he got really, really sick too. And he was throwing up dry heaving and having explosive diarrhea for three days early on in his time. And he went on to stay 72 days. So it's, definitely looks from the visit with a doctor like Benji has really intense parasites happening and that leaving was a good call. So not saying that Benji didn't make the right call. I think that he did, but I just believe that humility going in would have made a real difference for him. He clearly was doing really, really well. He was very committed. Looks like he was eating better than anyone else. He had great resources, but his attitude was a, potentially a bit of a problem. And here's what I wanna say is that having a really positive attitude and holding your goal in mind and being goal oriented can be a really good thing. So having in your mind, there's no way I'm going home, I'm gonna do this and being determined, that can be helpful. But when we do it from a place of ego and a place of competition and something to prove, that doesn't tend to go as well. So what I really love about watching Benji's journey is that he is learning and changing through all of the things he experiences. Built a big shelter said, you know what? That wasn't a good idea, I'm changing it. Went in right away saying, I'm not gonna worry about shelter for 30 days. Within a few days, he was changing it and building shelter. Went in saying, I'm gonna go more than 100 days. I'm better than the other folks out here and I can do this. And then came out saying, hey, you know what? Humility is super important and humility really is what it's all about and i've learned big lessons and i'm really taking those home so as much as the way he was talking about winning didn't rub me the right way i'm really impressed by benji and his ability to learn and process and shift and verbalize it and be vulnerable in front of millions of viewers so I really hope that you were able to get treated and that you're covered well and that you got a lot of everything you were looking for from this journey, Benji. And it was really, really lovely getting to experience it with you. So thanks so much.